on this side of the world it's not that often that we get to see a genuine JGTC race car but here at World Time Attack Dale Malone has brought out his uh, Z33 that's behind us so for a start and I'm not a hundred percent locked in on the details of the JGTC championship I believe yep. this is a GT300 car can you talk to us a little bit about what that championship is yep. what the differences between GT300 and 500 are and maybe what sort of cars we're seeing competing for sure. Well, um, GT300 was a lower category, uh, still a works back program. Uh, GT500 had more aero, more horsepower. These, by the name GT300, are limited to 300 horsepower approximately at the wheel, and they they would uh, balance it out as a balance of parity through the through the series. Um, but as you can see on this car, it's got the GT500 aero, and that was a um, a homologation upgrade, um, and so that was passed on yeah, down from GT500. Okay, so. I want to get a little bit deeper into the aero and the other elements that you've talked about, like balance of performance. But before we, we do that, how does someone in Australia come to own a genuine JGTC GT300 Nissan race car? I got lucky. Uh, I was chasing the previous S15 for a fair while, uh, and then it came up where I was able to buy it, and I was, that wasn't expected. Um, I had that for a few years, obviously, and then um, after we'd sort of finished restoring the car and getting it back to a really good running standard, uh, a collector in Europe decided that he wanted to purchase the car, and um, that gave me the opportunity to, to look for other cars. Uh, and I'd sort of tracked the history on this car for a little while, and it was sitting over in Canada and uh, wasn't really being used over there. So uh, we were able to come to a deal and, and get the car over here. And I've also managed to purchase all the uh, x work spares package. So, um, you know, we've got spare body panels, 50-something wheels, spare engines, gearboxes, enough to run there, you know, control arms, a whole lot. So it made sense to purchase that because you can never build something like this yourself. So. There, there was going to be one of my next questions, how, how daunting is it buying a, a Nismo factory built race car mm. and, and then that's one thing but the serviceability, the, yeah. the new parts supply, that, that could be quite daunting? Uh, they're, they're tough to service but I've got a good understanding from previously and the crew's got a good understanding of the previous S15 um, and as, as manufacturers typically do they keep uh, a character, uh, especially in design and architecture uh, of componentry and engineering, they carry a lot of that through. So we already understand those things. Um, I was able to get a lot of the service manual and data from Nismo. So we've got maintenance time periods, we've got uh, service intervals and lifespans, uh, and we can monitor that. The car is actually really easy to work on. Um, because it's naturally aspirated, we don't have oil lines hanging around the engine bay, no turbos, no um, it, you know, it, it's a very simple package. It looks complex, but um, yeah, it's a very simple package. Okay, let, let's talk a little bit about the engine in it, uh, because I was interested to find out it's actually the, the VQ35DE, which is the earlier Z33 350Z engine. Yep. Not normally the, the go-to option if you want to build a, a decent 350, the, yep. the, uh, the later HR or even the 370 Total engine uh, are, are a, a more popular option with a little bit more power. So yeah. why did Nismo go that route? I think it was down to homologation. So these cars were built and designed around the DE. Um, so homologation started in 2003, and that was also FIA homologation. Um, and as you can probably see, you know, in the engine bay, where everything's mounted, it's mounted at a, a set drivetrain height. So you've got a situation where if they're putting a taller deck height in there with the heads and whatnot, packaging is really hard to update and re-engineer on a on a works program package. So um, they stayed with it. It worked. Um, they changed a lot of the componentry inside the engine. Uh, Pankel did all the rotating assembly for them. Uh, and the main tunnel is about five millimetres bigger in diameter. Uh, as so there's the main bearing tunnel for the crankshaft, so. Main, main bearing tunnel, um, as well as uh, Conrad journals um, are significantly bigger as well. So the whole assembly has been enlarged to try and deal with that. Um, harmonics and resonance is an issue. So uh, we have to be selective on how we're going to you know, really lean on it. Um, but the way it's set up, it's quite protected. Um, so unless we're doing something stupid, we really shouldn't have any maintenance issues with it. All right, so talk to us about the, the power level. Um, you, you've already mentioned sort of GT300, around 300 horsepower, the wheels. Have you had it on a dyno? Do you know what it's making? Uh, no, I haven't had it on a dyno, um, but we know what's making because of the mapping. 
So we've got all the original engine mapping um, and the dyno logs. So we know what they're making at the flywheel and also um, on their bench system. So we can translate that to, to know what it produces. An interesting aspect here with this uh, balance of performance so, uh, about the different manufacturers racing in that GT300 class is uh, the restrictor size and we can see that very clearly in the engine bay and you're running two tiny restrictors. I, I've, I've seen there it's got I think 27.6 millimetre inscribed on it so that, that's what you're running. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's what I've got with the car and that's on the map at the moment. Um, they actually had a variety of sizes up to 28 mil all the way down to 23. Uh, and you'd probably see the taper on there. Um, they changed with the taper length uh, as well as the plenum volume. So that was all used to tune uh, both on and off throttle power delivery um, and also to try and get a bit of a boost in um, resonance of airspeed. Um, so different tracks in Japan would be much tighter. Um, if they were at a low grip circuit, they would, they would change the power delivery through that curve um, and it saved them having to tune via camshafts and ripping the engine apart and, and playing with timing on, on you know, timing events and torque delivery. In terms of changing the um, the restrictor size, is it is it then a case of uh, a different map required in the in the ECU, or yep. is it mapped so that you can change um, among all of the different restrictors without doing dealing with the electronic side of things? It's a tough one because um, the mapping system is TPS over RPM with a few compensations, so um, it it would be out of character for for the tune if we did change the. Um, it wouldn't be ideal, it probably could be done, but um, I certainly know in the program that they had very, very strict data on, uh, you know, this restrictor size only goes with this map and you'd have to upload it to the computer and, and adapt it for every change. I mean, that's exactly what I, I would expect where you're not actually yeah. monitoring airflow directly but running Alpha N instead. And I assume the basis of that, if it's running Alpha N, uh, fair to assume that it's running individual throttle bodies underneath that beautiful carbon plenum? It is. Um, there's two types on this one. So there's a barrel roller, which is on this one. And there's also a uh, butterfly system. Um, this one runs 55 mil uh, individual uh, trumpets on the top of the barrels. Um, and as you can see, the plenum volume is about 28 litres. So um, it's quite massive. Massive. So that plenum volume, as you've said, massive there, and, and it's visually like very clear that, yep. that they've put a huge volume into it. Is there a sort of an advantage in terms of uh, being able to draw the atmospheric air in that plenum before the restrictors sort of come in, or does it not really work like that? Uh, that's the idea. So um, the restrictors uh, are force-fed at the front, so it's uh, positive pressure as the car's moving. But when you're off-throttle, um, that air will build up inside that system. So um, it, as soon as the driver gets back on throttle, uh, it's essentially an unrestricted engine for a given period. Until it empties that plenum and starts drawing essentially a, a vacuum again. Spot on, yeah. Um, the, the tapered runners were also tweaked depending on how long the straights were. Um, and the, the idea behind that was to try and play with the high speed pressure that was built up in the front of the car to try and get them a few more kilometres of, of horsepower down the, you know, equivalent horsepower down the straight, but, you know, we're talking three, four kilometres. I mean, this is all stuff that uh, we at an enthusiast level would struggle to test and, and validate, but of course, when you've got the resources of a manufacturer, these are those small iterative improvements that can mean the difference between winning and losing, correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the team that looked after the engine, um, the engine package for all these cars, they weren't as a part of Nismo. They were a contractor for Nismo. Um, and I know that they would have four people per car looking after that car on the engine and mapping side. And that was purely their job. So the team didn't have to worry about doing their own mapping or tuning. It was, they would get to the track, that support was provided and, and dialed in and tuned. Okay, in terms of, of horsepower, can, can you give us some sort of uh, rough idea and what sort of instantaneous boost in power do you get when you, in that situation you talked about where you've been off throttle, the, the plenum is back at atmospheric pressure yep. and that instantaneous before it starts drawing a vacuum and then uh, do you have any data on what the engine can produce if it was unrestricted? For sure, so um, depending on the RPM limit, um, unres well, sorry, unrestricted would be approximately 580. Um, the lifespan on that would be very short and just be, you know, harmonics and wear and tear. Um, what sort of RPM are they running to get to that 580 as well? Uh, that's a 10 and a half. So it's, it's up there. Yeah, it, it's not sustainable long term. It's a, it's a very short engine life. Um, with what's there now, with the plenum volume, we can expect 420, 450 um, on a short burst. Um, but again, that depends on the RPM because the camshaft timing and everything in there is, is, is very particular. So if you've got the right gear 
and you're loaded up in the right gear for you know at the right road speed, you'll be able to use that and actually um, you know get get the best usage out of that torque boost. Um, but if you're in the wrong gear, it's wasted. So yeah. And obviously very short lived until the uh, the plenum starts drawing a vacuum, but essentially uh, push to pass for a naturally aspirated engine. Essentially, yeah. It's actually funny because the acceleration of it through the first you know, three, four gears is, is phenomenal. Um, you know, we're getting up to excessive speeds here between some of the corners, but on the longer straights, it's just, you could almost have a coffee while you're driving, you know, down the straight, so. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you, you've brought a, a, maybe a, a knife to a gunfight here, running in a class where a thousand horsepower is, is not uncommon. So yeah. you've definitely got your work uh, cut out for you, particularly with the long length of that front straight here at Eastern Creek. But of course, that's not what the car was built for. It's great to see it out here. Yeah. Uh, just talking about the rest of the package, uh, electronics as well on, on a car like this can be, can be tricky, uh, yep. where you may not necessarily have access to the calibration. So what's the situation there? Can you tune this if needed? What was the electronics in the car? Um, the history on these electronics, uh, it was a Pectel Cosworth system. Um, and it was developed uh, by uh, obviously the European side and they were working in hand with Nismo. And so everything was developed for Nissan Motorsport. Um, it is a T6 old school Pectel ECU, um, but it's got a different injector driver allocation so it's got 12 injector drivers but only three ignition drivers so it's a wasted spark but you know 12, 12 but you've got six extra injectors that aren't necessary and injectors on sequential but in you know ignition on wasted so um you know there, there's a few funny things but they were they were using the resources that were there at the time we've got to remember as well in terms of the electronics this is a, a couple of generations old now it's certainly not cutting edge by yeah. today's standards well, to actually uh, program it, so the programming software was um, Desk Pro, uh, people know that obviously, but it was specially made for Nissan Motorsport and so the only way to communicate using that software is on a Windows 95 based laptop um, because it does, uh, this, this is quite funny actually, it's not serial, so it goes from parallel port uh, to CAN. So it's a very early version of CAN and so you've got to rely on a parallel port to uh, bi-directional data and it's very hard to get that to work. But it, we can tune it if we want to. Um, but the question then becomes, if we're putting that much energy and effort to remapping a throttle position over RPM based sort of engine, would it be not wiser to, to protect and keep what's here in a box and seal it up and update it with some, you know, PDM and that sort of thing. Is there an element you have to keep in mind with a historic race car with some significance like this in terms of, of not really modifying or messing with what's there and keeping it genuine and, and how it was built originally? It's, it's a hard thing to pick because um, you want to have every, if, you know, competing, we want to have every protection available. We don't want to be risking the car in any way. The car, sure, yes, rent runs really well like this, but um, I think from my point of view, if I can keep and preserve what's there um, and even if I put that aside and what I do retrofit in there is not um, going to detract from the car or, or something that can't be replaced or, or switched out so um, to do that would probably be remating up bulkhead connectors using what's there and you know completely rewiring the car but not taking away from anything or damaging anything. So. I mean there's been plenty of examples we've seen and shot in the past oh. where people have retrofitted a current generation ECU inside a, a big box and just basically pinned it out to the existing wiring so it's a nice solution that's always something that you can return to stock so I guess the, the, yeah. the uh, other aspect is if it isn't broken don't fix it if it's running well and doing what you need uh, maybe just uh, as well to leave the thing alone. I think for the time being we're going to do that. Um, you know, we, this is our first laps in the car at the event and the crew's learning the car as well. So, you know, we're learning a lot on the car and we did eight laps yesterday and we'll do a few more today and um, it works well as it is. But I'm sure in time as we get more used to the car and setup wise that the demand for more power or, or you know, maybe a few more controls would be there. So, uh, especially maybe traction or, you know, throttle limiting and flat shift and, you know, the flat shift system is on this one is very primitive. There's no load cell and it runs off a barrel position. So as soon as it sees a barrel position change, you know, it goes to cut. So you've got to be very careful the way you drive it. And you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a bit sensitive that way. Uh, let, let's talk about that transmission then since you, you brought it up. So what, yeah. what is it running? Uh, it's a Hewland transmission, specially made for Nismo. Um, it's, a, it's a split shaft design. So the input shaft is lower and the output shaft is higher. Um, the gears aren't fixed um, and, and, and solid machined on either of the shafts, so they're all replaceable. So you can change individual ratios? Yeah. It's actually DG, DG9, I think it is, um, gear components. So dog rings, shift forks, all that are, are, are cross-transferable. Um, 
um, internally oil pumped uh, magnesium housing. So that's the only sort of caveat with this box is we've got to keep an eye on it for hairline fractures and things like that and also keep corrosion inhibitors up to it. I mean, Hewland, a brand that we don't hear so much on, on this side of the world, but obviously yeah. a European brand that is uh, is very well renowned in, yes. in motorsports. So definitely not strangers to producing a quality uh, gearbox. So just yeah. coming back to that cut. So uh, just to, for, to clarify, maybe for those who aren't too familiar with what we're talking about, yeah. these days traditionally we'd have a load cell on the uh, gear knob. So basically that's a strain gauge that lets the ECU know when you're starting to pull on the gear lever. Yep. Then the ECU can instigate a fuel or ignition card or maybe both to unload the dogs and allow the, the shift to operate. So instead of doing that, they're actually doing it through sensing the beginning of the movement of the shift barrel, correct? correct. Yeah, that's right. So the way they've machined the shift barrel, they've allowed um, basically a, a small amount of ramp in the barrel. Um, and then the sensor position sensor, it's just the throttle position sensor essentially. Uh, as soon as the ECU sees that voltage start to creep, um, it will then assume that you're in a, in a shifting position uh, and it will ramp out um, ignition. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not consistent so i was going to ask how are you finding that or are you using it or are you conventionally shifting with a throttle lift or a clutch dab for now um shifting it like a tri typical you know h pattern with a with a bit of a, a clutch hit um because i've got to familiarize myself with that box and um it, it's it's uh an uncanny feeling when you're when you when you're trying to shift and you feel that it's not unloading completely, especially when you're used to modern modern designs. So um, it, it's a little bit confusing at times, but it's something just to adapt to, and it's the way the car has to be driven. So um, you know, it just takes a bit more care, and um, it'll keep it alive. So. In, in terms of driver displays, logging, what, what have you got there at your disposal and, disposal and are you using any logging or at the moment you're just feeling the car out because it's early days? Uh, doing some basic data, so it's a PIA research logger system um, and that logs all the channels on the car, all the suspension pots uh, and whatnot. We've chosen to look at the basics at the moment purely because I want to get used to the car without uh, over complicating and chasing and we've got to be careful here this weekend because the track's changing every session um, and so it, I guess if, if, if I get too deep into the data trying to set up a car I could be chasing something that doesn't exist and uh, I'd much rather just get my seat in and get used to the car and um, we'll review all of that later. Obviously, the car was never designed for time attack, and, and as we mentioned, you're woefully underpowered compared to some of the competition. So, what, what's the uh, the ultimate idea? Are you prepared to go door to door in uh, in another racing class with this, or is it going to be for uh, just uh, exhibition purposes? Um, door to door would be great. Uh, we've got to wait on sports sedan to see. We've got to apply for approval because the bodywork is obviously. Um, a bit more extravagant than what the rules regulated here so um, they may require some changes but we'll, we'll review that and see what's needed um, maybe selective GT events because I know they have you know three hours and four hours uh, which aren't which aren't your pro level GT events they're more of your gentleman driver type stuff so um, we'll do that get the car out and enjoy it and um, time attack is obviously not as disciplined and it's 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 yeah like you say knife to a gunfight so um, here is just about enjoying the event and um, you know people get to see a classic old school GT car out there and um, you know we get a bit of data and you know it's, it's all in all it's a good day I mean, it, it's definitely not going to be the fastest car here at World Time Attack, but, but as you yeah. say, I mean, it's, it's a car that we wouldn't often get to see in the flesh. So yeah. uh, certainly I appreciate the fact that you've oh, gone to the you. trouble of bringing the car out and I uh, look forward to seeing it run. Thanks for your time, Dale. Thanks, Andrew. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.